Thousand Tales presents The Weird Violin, read by Matthew Carson. The great Polish violinist, S.E.E., was strolling aimlessly about the town on a sunny but cold afternoon in November of a certain year. He was to play, at night, at one of the great concerts which made the town so musically famous, and, according to his usual custom, he was observing passers-by, looking in shop windows, and thinking of anything rather than the approaching ordeal. Not that he was nervous, for none could be less so, but he came to his work all the fresher for an hour or two of idle forgetfulness and astonished his audiences the more. Turning out of the busiest street, he ambled into a comparatively quiet thoroughfare and, throwing away an inch of cigar end, produced a new Havana lighting up with every sign of enjoyment. Now, it was part of his rule when out on these refreshing excursions to avoid music shops, and he had already passed half a dozen without doing more than barely recognize them. It is therefore very remarkable that, walking by a large music warehouse in this quiet thoroughfare, he should suddenly stop and, after remaining in doubt for a few moments, go straight to the window and look in. He had not seen anything when he first passed, and, indeed, he had merely ascertained, out of the corner of his eye, that one of the forbidden shops was near. Why, then, did he feel impelled to return? The window was stocked, as all such windows are, with instruments, music, and such appurtenances as resin, bows, chin rests, mutes, strings, bridges, and pegs. An old Guinarius, valued at several hundred guineas, lay alongside a shilling set of bones, and a flagellet, an ocarina, and several mouth organs were gracefully grouped upon a gilt-edged copy of Elijah. Amongst the carefully arranged violins was a curious old instrument, the like of which the virtuoso had never seen before, and at this he now stared with all his eyes. It was an ugly, squat violin of heavy pattern and ancient appearance. The maker, whoever he had been, had displayed considerable eccentricity throughout its manufacture, but more especially in the scroll, which, owing to some freak, he had carved into the semblance of a hideous, grinning face. There was something horribly repulsive about this strange work of art, and yet it also possessed a subtle fascination. The violinist, keeping his eyes upon the face, which seemed to follow his movements with fiendish persistency, slowly edged to the door and entered the shop. The attendant came forward and, recognizing the well-known performer, bowed low. That is a curious-looking fiddle in the window, began the artist, at once with a wave of his hand in the direction of the fiend. Which one, sir? inquired the attendant. Oh, the one with the remarkable scroll, you mean. I'll get it for you. Drawing aside a little curtain, he dived into the window bay and produced the instrument whose face seemed to be grinning more maliciously than ever. A fair tone, sir, added the man, but nothing to suit you, I'm sure. As soon as her S touched the neck of the violin, he gripped it convulsively and raised the instrument to his chin. Then, for a few moments, he stood firm as a rock, his eyes fixed upon the awe-stricken attendant, evidently without seeing him. A bow, said the musician, at length, in a low voice. He stretched out his disengaged hand and took it without moving his eyes. Then he stopped four strings with his long fingers and drew the horse hair smartly over them with one rapid sweep, producing a rich chord in a minor key. A slight shiver passed over his frame as the notes were struck, and the look of concentration upon his face changed to one of horror, but he did not cease. Slowly dropping his gaze, the performer met the jibing glance of the scroll face, and though his own countenance blanched, and his lips tightened as if to suppress a cry, 
the bow was raised again, and the violin spoke. Did the demon whisper to those moving, nervous fingers? It almost seemed to be doing so, and surely such a melody as came from the instrument was born of no human mind. It was slow and measured, but no solemnity was suggested. It thrilled the frame, but with terror. Not delight, it was a chain of sounds, which like a sick man's passing fancy, slipped out of the memory as soon as it was evolved and was incapable call. Slowly, when the last strains were lost, the great violinist dropped both arms to his side and stood for a few moments, grasping violin and bow without speaking. There were drops of perspiration on his forehead, and he was pale and weary-looking. When he spoke, it was in a faint voice, and he seemed to address himself to something invisible. I cannot endure it now, he said. I will play again tonight. Do you wish to play on the instrument at this evening's concert, sir? inquired the dealer, not without some astonishment at the choice, much as the performance had affected him. Yes, yes, of course, was the reply, given with some irritability, the speaker having apparently roused himself from his semi-stupor. As the dealer took back the fiddle, he chanced to turn it back uppermost. It was a curiously marked piece of wood, a black patch spreading over a large portion and throwing an ugly blur upon the otherwise exquisite purling. See, gasped the artist, pointing a shaking finger at this blotch and clutching at the shopkeeper's shoulder. Blood! Good gracious! ejaculated the other, shrinking back in alarm. Are you ill, sir? Blood! Blood! repeated the half-demented musician, and he staggered out of the shop. It was night, and the concert room was crowded to excess. The performers upon the platform, accustomed as they were to such sights, could not but gaze with interest at the restless sea of eager, expectant faces which stretched before them. That indescribable noise, a multitude of subdued murmurs, accompanied by the discordant scraping of strings and blowing of reeds, was at its height. Now and then a loud trombone would momentarily assert itself, or an oboe's plaintive notes would rise above the tumult, and, in short, the moment of intense excitement, which immediately precedes the entrance of the conductor, was at hand. Suddenly, the long-continued confusion ceased, and, for an incalculably short space of time, silence reigned and a storm of deafening applause burst forth. Necks were craned, and eyes strained in vain attempts to catch an early glimpse of the great violinist who was to open the concert by playing a difficult concerto of Spoffer. It was noticed that as the virtuoso followed the gray-haired conductor to the center of the platform, he was unusually pale, and those who were seated at no great distance from the orchestra observed also that he carried a curious violin instead of the Stradivarius upon which he was wont to perform. A tap on the conductor's desk, a short, breathless silence, and the sweet strains of the opening bars issued from the instruments of a hundred able musicians. The soloist, with a sinking at the heart, which he could scarcely account for, raised the violin to his shoulder and saw for the first time that it had been re-strung, as he invariably left stringing and tuning to others, this would appear to have been a matter of no moment, and yet it had a strange effect upon him. Again that shudder passed through his body, and again he unwillingly met the glance of those diabolical eyes upon the scroll. Horror of horrors! Was the face alive? Or was he going mad? The band, which had swelled out to a loud forte, now dropped to a pianissimo. The moment had arrived. Hers raised his bow and commenced the lovely adagio. What had come to him? Where were the concert room, the orchestra, the anxious crowd of people? What sounds were these? This was not Spover. 
This sweet melody so like, and yet so unlike the weird music which he had played in the dealer's shop. What subtle magic had so acted upon those strains that their horror, their cruel mockery, had entirely vanished, and sweet, pure harmony alone remained? It seemed to the player that he stood within a small but comfortably furnished room. Two figures were in the room, those of a beautiful young girl and of a dark, handsome, foreign-looking man. There was something in the face of the latter which vividly recalled the face upon the scroll, and, strange to say, a counterpart of the violin itself rested under the man's chin. The girl was seated at a harpsichord, and, as she played, her companion accompanied her upon his strange instrument. From the costume of both, the dreamer concluded that they were phantoms of a hundred years ago. Ernestine, the man was saying in a low voice as he passed his bow over the strings, tell me tonight that you have not dismissed me forever. I can wait for your love. It is useless, replied the girl. Oh, it is quite useless. Why importune me further? I could never love you, even if I were not already promised to another. A savage light gleamed in the man's eye, and more than ever he looked like the face on the violin, but he did not immediately reply, and the music went on. You tell me it is useless, he said at length, and I tell you that it is useless. Useless for you to think of him. Do you hear? He continued lowering his violin and leaning towards her. You shall never marry him. I swear it by my soul. The girl shrank from him, and the music ceased. Though he did not know it, the dreaming violinist had reached the conclusion of the adagio movement. He did not hear the deafening plaudits which greeted the fall of his bow. He knew nothing of the enthusiasm of the orchestra or the praise of the conductor. He heard no more music. Look, what is this? The girl has seated herself upon a couch, and her lover, his violin still in his left hand, is kneeling at her feet, passionately imploring her to listen. She expostulates for a while, then repulses him and rises. A malignant fire darts from the furious foreigner's eyes. Something bright gleams in his hand. He rushes forward raises his arm to strike. The presto movement had commenced, and an extraordinary circumstance soon made itself apparent to the audience. The violinist was running away with the band, greatly to the horror of the conductor. The tempo had to be increased until a prestissimo was reached. Still, the performer was not satisfied. There seemed no limit to his powers tonight. His fingers literally flew up and down the fingerboard. His bow shot to and fro with incredible swiftness, and yet the music grew quicker, until the unhappy conductor, who with difficulty pulled along the toiling band, felt that a fiasco was inevitable. On, on rushed the fingers and the bow. Faster and faster still, a few of the bandsmen fell off from sheer exhaustion and stared, horror-stricken at the mad violinist. Some of the listeners rose in alarm, and many were only detained by extreme anxiety from bursting into loud and frantic applause. Suddenly, with the loud snap of a string, the spell was broken. The orchestra, unable now to proceed, stopped in utter confusion, and a loud sigh of released suspense went up from thousands of throats. Then the whole mass rose in sudden horror as the violinist dropped his instrument with a crash upon the platform, stared wildly around, clasped a hand to his side, and, with a strange cry, fell to the ground insensible. For weeks, the great violinist lay between life and death. Then nature reasserted herself, and he recovered. But it was long, very long ere he could again appear in public, whilst the weird and mysterious violin never again sent forth its strange and mysterious influence.
It had been hopelessly shattered in that last night of its performance, which had well-nigh proved fatal to the world-famed player. The end. Thank you for listening. If you like our recordings, consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel so you don't miss any more audiobooks.